everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Can you um, just hang tight with me for a minute while we add Instagram to our live today and then we'll launch into the discussion. This is a somewhat new technical thing we're doing here, so hopefully it will go smoothly. I just want to make sure it's working on Instagram as well. Okay, I see myself. Let's do this. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm your host, Dr. Chana Davis. I'm a geneticist and contributing writer at Those Nerdy Girls. We're going to be talking today about long COVID with Dr. Liz Marnick, who's an immunologist, professor, and science communicator. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with and learning from Liz over several years now, and I'm thrilled to have her here. Liz, do you want to say hello and say anything about yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm great to be here. And yeah, in addition to being an immunologist, I'm also a professor and I teach a variety of science classes, including immunology this semester. All right, well, I'm really um, thrilled to be launching into this super important topic of long COVID. And in fact, it is International Long COVID Awareness Day. And we, believe it or not, did not plan this. So um, just got lucky, luck of the Irish. I'm also dressed for uh, St. Patty's Day coming up. Uh, so just uh, before we get into some questions, I wanted to uh, give a couple definitions or just terminology, and then we'll get into some background. So, um, so Liz, let's start off with um, what, um, what is long COVID? How is it diagnosed and defined? And maybe you can also tell us a couple of different acronyms that are used here. Yeah, so unfortunately, there is kind of a changing terminology that's happening. The people who first started realizing that this existed were the patients and they called it long COVID. And the organizations like the World Health Organization and the CDC have started transitioning to call it post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, which abbreviates as P-A-S-C. So a lot of times you will see those words used interchangeably. Sometimes the literature uses both. Sometimes it will use long COVID. Sometimes it will use that post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. And that's really the big definition that you're going to hear come up in different conversations. So the second part of that question was, how is it defined and how is it diagnosed? And that really is something that's still kind of being figured out. So if you look at the general consensus, people are looking for lingering symptoms after somebody has had a COVID-19 infection. And the best definition seems to be lingering for more than three months because we do know sometimes it can linger for a shorter period of time and it's really the persistence at three months and longer that is used to really define whether or not somebody has long COVID. And the issue that we'll, we'll get into probably a few times throughout this is that it's really hard to diagnose because it's so variable. So we there is a criteria of, of symptoms that include things like fatigue, brain fog, joint pain. Um, some people have drops in their blood pressure that's associated with something called POTS. People might have GI issues or heart palpitations. So it really is a constellation of factors and not every patient has all of those things. So that's where why they really use that diagnosis of some type of lingering symptom, at least one or more, for longer than that three month period mm -hmm. after having COVID-19. One thing that I just realized as you were talking is that it's not necessarily the same symptoms of the acute infection, right? The symptoms you have afterwards are actually different. It's not necessarily the congestion um, or sore throat, you know, that are the acute symptoms. So it's a different set of symptoms that might linger. Yeah, definitely some people can have lingering coughs because of lung co complications that last for a long time afterwards. But generally the symptoms are very different than what happened while you were acutely sick with the actual infection. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying there's not really an easy way to know if, you know, something that you're experiencing for a month or two after your infection is actually caused by the infection itself? Yeah, right now, because there isn't one easy test to use to diagnose it, we really have to rely on providers listening to patients when they go into their office and explain the types of ex experiences and symptoms that they're having after their COVID-19 infection. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why too, you see a lot of varying, a lot of times in the literature, how often you have it, all of the causes of it vary a lot because there is really a wide range of experiences people have after having that COVID-19 mm -hmm. infection. I wonder if we'll ever have some sort of molecular test for 
there is re there is research being done and there is some exciting like immune profiling or hormonal profiling that seems to correlate with people who have long COVID, but how well that will translate into a diagnostic test, I don't think we know yet. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's probably also an element of ruling out other things. Yeah, so a lot of times it will depend too. Unfortunately, I've heard a variety of experiences told to me by people who have long COVID in terms of how hard or how easy it was for their doctor to believe that they were experiencing the symptoms that they were having. And I think that is something that a lot of people face when they're experiencing any type of post viral complication. Yeah. So they usually will rule out obvious things, do tests, and then if they can't find any other clear cause, then they likely will cause call it long COVID. Though that's not always everyone's case. Some providers may not even think of long COVID and then those patients might struggle with finding some type of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So this, this naturally leads into the next question of what causes long COVID or what do we think causes long COVID? Yeah, so there, the exact mechanism is not known and there's a lot of research being done on this topic. And right now there's kind of a, a spread of possibilities being looked into. And I think the scientific community is starting to think that it might not be one mechanism. So I mentioned at the beginning how there's a wide variety of types of symptoms that patients experience. Mm -hmm. And it might be that certain people with certain symptoms have one mechanism causing it and another constellation of symptoms correspond to a separate distinct mechanism. Okay. So some of the common mechanisms are, one is that it could induce autoimmunity. So autoimmunity is when normally your immune system should be able to detect a pathogen or something foreign and tell that apart from your own tissues and your own cells. Mm -hmm. But in patients who have autoimmune disease, that process is not happening correctly. So mm -hmm. the patient's own immune system starts attacking parts of their body and it varies. Every part of the body impacted can be different. And people with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it attacks the lining of their joints. Something like lupus is systemic and it's attacking multiple parts of an individual's body. So that's one theory is that people mm -hmm. who have long COVID, it's tr having that COVID-19 infection is actually triggering some type of autoimmune process in those patients. Mm -hmm. And then... Do you, sorry. That, yeah, that was just saying that that was one, <laughs> just, yeah. just I'm yeah. making sure that, okay, go on, carry on. Sorry. Um, the second thought is potentially that there's a viral reservoir. So what that means is that we know that some people, the virus can linger in for a long period of time. And there's some evidence that it might hang out in the gut or in other areas of the body. So that might be one possible cause is that in some mm -hmm. patients, they might have persistent area where they still have the virus and their symptom could be caused from their immune system trying to get rid of that, vi that virus or from the damage that's being caused by the virus itself. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the second possible okay. thought being considered. Okay. And then there's more. So this okay. is like a, a quite an area of active active debate and active research. So the second or the third option that people are looking into is that it could some of the symptoms could be caused by reactivation of other latent viruses. Mm. So this one is a little bit kind of harder, I think, for people to kind of think about. So when we've been infected with a virus, most of the time we think about how once we've recovered, the virus is gone from our body. But we know that that's actually not true for all viruses. So something like Epstein-Barr virus, that's the virus that causes mono. And it's a lot of times referenced as EBV. That mm -hmm. virus actually remains dormant in your body mm -hmm. all the time once you've had it. And we see that in some people who have, who have long COVID, they're actually seeing reactivation of that virus. And that mm -hmm. could be contributing to some of their symptoms. A similar thing right. for chickenpox, the virus that causes chickenpox, that also can remain dormant. And then mm. we are seeing that reactivate in patients. So that's another possible possible cause. Yeah. So yeah, these different mechanisms would definitely have different risk profiles. Um, so that's that's something that a lot of people have questions about, you know, in terms of understanding their risk. And it's certainly not a one size fits all answer, right? Um, right? Before we move on to discussing risk, I just wanted to mention um, that these q a sessions are always informed by questions in the nerdy girls uh, inbox and so there's one question here i just want to shout out to a one of our readers 
Um, Steve from Georgia, he asked, would you elaborate more on the theories of long COVID? Why is long COVID not being talked about more? It seems COVID and long COVID will continue to be an issue for years to come. Do you have anything else you want to add to Steve? <laughs> yeah, so I kind of already talked about some of the big theories that are being looked into, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that how much somebody thinks about long COVID or hears about long COVID is probably a lot dependent on like the niche communities that you're involved in. So I think about it a lot and I hear about it a lot because I, I personally know quite a few people impacted from long COVID and I interact with a lot of people from that community. So it's something that's always on my mind, but I talk about long COVID in some of my classes and I know that students necessarily have not heard about it. So I do think that there is potentially a little bit of a lack of awareness of the fact that this is a risk after having a COVID-19 infection. So yeah. I think it is important that we start having these types of conversations more, which is great that you're doing this. And then also that the CDC and other health organizations also talk about it more just so mm -hmm. that people understand that it is a risk and it can help people because if somebody's having lingering symptoms and they don't know what's going on, they can feel very alone. So then having a way of, of connecting to a community of people experiencing the same thing can mm -hmm. be valuable. In addition to knowing that it is a risk that we should be aware of. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see the CDC, um, you know, talking about this more and hopefully other health organizations will just raise more awareness and, um, you know, avoid having people being dismissed and really yes. recognizing this is a real problem impacting, impacting millions of people. So yes. we definitely should be talking about it more. And although some communities already are talking about it a lot, as you're saying, to your point. Yeah. Um, so let's um, let's move on to talking about risk factors, because that's a question that we get um, often in different forms. Um, so just the general question here, and I'll, I'll mention some specific ones later, is how common is long COVID and what are the risk factors? Yeah, so this is a this is a very good question. And I Sorry, one second, I gotta fix oh, my, uh, there we go. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. And this is one of the things I wanna acknowledge and how difficult it is to kind of evaluate risks because every paper you look at is gonna give you a, a different percentage or a different likelihood of the risk. And that really comes down to the fact that there is no clear test or no clear way to diagnose patients. So every study kind of uses a slightly different definition or a slightly different mm -hmm. combination to get at whether or not somebody they classify somebody as having long COVID. So that re really results in a variety of, of percentages being talked about in terms of how common the mm -hmm. presence of long COVID actually is. But just to give you some examples, um, it does it does vary, but we are seeing so places like the World Health Organization, estimate about 10 to 20% of the population have long COVID. And again, that's a range. And we see that also reflected in studies. Some studies suggest potentially higher, but again, that's a, a lot of that's based on the data and the way that they define it. Mm -hmm. Then we have places like the UK, which they use their national health database to kind of get at the numbers. And they have a, a lot of a lower estimate. They're as actually estimating that about 2.7% of their population. Mm -hmm has it. And that could be because of the different populations. The World Health Organization is looking at it globally, whereas yeah. the UK is going to be more focused on their individual and on their individual constituents. Yeah. And then we have places like the CDC that are more on par right now with the 3.4%. But mm -hmm. at previous times, they also were closer to the 10 to 25%. So it really does vary depending on the studies being used to reflect that. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are, um, I guess I'll tell you some specific questions and then you can start to think about, you know, how would you know your own risk? So two examples of questions from, from readers. Rachel from Maryland, she asked, what is my risk of developing a chronic disability due to a COVID infection if I have all my COVID vaccines and I'm generally healthy? How does that compare to other risks we take in our daily lives? What is the long COVID risk for infants, older children, adults, elderly? So I know we, you can't, you can't give a specific number for all these, but maybe giving ballparks would be helpful. Yeah, so this is hard, I think, because we know that there are some characteristics that increase the likelihood of somebody having 
long COVID after an infection. Mm -hmm. But we also know that there are lots of people who didn't have any of those risk factors that they knew about, and they still developed long COVID after mm -hmm. an infection. So it's really hard to get specific numbers on this type of information. Mm -hmm. And again, that's really because the studies are still being done. We're still learning about this process mm -hmm. and it's hard to really give exact risk percentages. But we do know some things that can help you think about this. So in terms of risk factors, we know that things like being older increases your risk. Having a more severe infection increases your risk but you still can get it after a mild infection. We just know that the likelihood is a little bit greater if the infection mm -hmm. is severe. Mm -hmm. And then we know that if somebody had a latent infection like EBV in the past, that that correlates with a higher risk mm -hmm. of getting long COVID after. Mm -hmm. Also having some pre-existing health conditions. So already having an autoimmune disease or having other complications like asthma and heart disease, those make it a little bit more likely that you're, you might have long COVID after an infection. Mm -hmm. And then there's things we know that help. So we know that vaccination does reduce the risk and the data varies in how much, but we have some recent reports that if you have gotten at least three vaccines, the risk is reduced by about 70% compared to if you haven't had any vaccines or haven't had at least those three. Now, again, that doesn't mean you're not going to get it after getting those three vaccines, right? It just mm -hmm. means that the risk is reduced, but that risk still remains. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. conversation to have because I, I get people who, after I post those types of information, that data, people are like, well, I had four vaccines and I got COVID and then got long COVID, right? right. And, and I don't want them to think that we're invalidating that because it mm -hmm. just because the risk is reduced does not mean that the risk is zero. Yeah, And so this is why it's really hard to have these conversations about risk, because we really need more data to really understand. We can't look at you or look at me and be like, oh, I for sure am not going to get long COVID or this person mm -hmm. for sure is going to get long COVID mm -hmm. because we don't have enough information to make those decisions. And I think yeah. really the only way that we can for sure not get long COVID is to not get COVID in the first place. And that is not always possible for everyone depending on the type of life circumstance they have. So it's a really hard conversation. And that probably doesn't answer her question effectively, but yeah. I really can't put more numbers on it than that because we don't have yeah. information to yeah. say. I mean, I guess you could say it's in the range of three to 30%. Right, exactly. Based on the national, the yeah. combined national data that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's um, hard because, oh, sorry. I was going to say there's a, a related question. Um, Bridget from Washington, she asked, are there any actions I can take now that will reduce my risk of long COVID when I ultimately get COVID other than preventative measures to avoid infection? So avoiding infection is the best. You mentioned vaccines. Is there anything else that might help lower your risk? Yeah, so there is some data that resting can make a big difference. So sometimes there's like the urge when we're sick to kind of push through it. And there is some evidence that it actually is probably better to actually listen to your body and rest when your body mm -hmm. tells you to rest and forcing yourself to do things and exercise and all those things could actually make it a little bit more likely. There also is some limited evidence and I want to highlight that it is limited that I, like when you look at populations that individuals who exercise regularly before their COVID infection are a little bit less likely to get it long COVID after their infection. But again, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you exercise and you won't get it, right? It's not a 100% thing. It just, when we look at a population level, we see it's a slightly reduced risk compared mm -hmm. to somebody who didn't exercise prior to infection. Mm -hmm. But vaccination and avoiding infection is really the two best ways we currently have. Yeah. And just, I guess, doing anything to keep your immune system in good, good shape, which are... Some of the fundamentals we talked about in my podcast once, right? Yes, yes. So yeah, that like vaccination support your immune system, a good a good healthy diet, exercise, all of that stuff helps helps you be healthy in general. And mm -hmm. we know that that again can help reduce the risk, but again doesn't eliminate the risk. Yeah. So another question that comes up often is um, from people who have long COVID: is is it safe to get another vaccine if you have long COVID? 
Yeah, so this is a hard question because you kind of, and I feel for these individuals because they kind of have to wrestle with two, two options, right? So they have to wrestle with the fact that they could get exposed to COVID again and get infected. And they have to consider doing that without having a recent vaccine or with having a recent vaccine. Mm-hmm. And this is hard because there is some report, like reports in the literature and anecdotally that you can hear, that pe- some people who have long COVID do report worsening symptoms after getting a vaccine. Mm-hmm. And this could be due to the immune response, especially maybe in people who are more prone to like the autoimmune maybe cause of long COVID. So their immune mm-hmm. system gets activated and it accidentally attacks itself too in the process. Mm-hmm. But um, in, in general, I think that this is a really hard conversation and they kind of need to think about it with their providers as they're balancing these risks. So mm-hmm. again, you have to think about if there's a possibility that you're gonna be exposed to COVID, we know that having the vaccine will help prevent some of these complications. Mm-hmm. So you have to really factor in whether or not you want to face COVID without having a recent vaccine, or if you want to get the vaccine and know that it will protect you more if you then get the infection after that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a hard conversation, but I want to acknowledge that, yes, there are some people who do re- re- report worsening symptoms after getting the vaccine. But then they also, there are also lots of people who report severely worsening symptoms after getting a reinfection. Right. So it's really hard to, to factor in those and it would be helpful to talk to your provider. And some people, we haven't had tons of data on this yet, but some people, um, some people report and some providers are seeing that Novavax might actually, it's a little bit less immunogenic. So it, it doesn't cause quite as much um, side effects in terms of fevers and immune response afterwards. Mm. So some people are noticing that Novavax is actually working a little bit better for those patients because mm. it's not causing quite as much of an immune response. That's interesting. In yeah, I would, I would, initial... Sorry, I was just going to ask whether this is something that actually ha- is just anecdotal at this point or whether we have actual studies because we had a reader question. Lauren from Maine, she asked, what are the data on getting the updated vaccine for those with long COVID? So are there actual data sets that you're aware of or is this, what's the case reports? Um, there is there is some data, uh, particularly from when we were looking at, um, some people reported like at, at, as vaccines were first being rolled out, some people with long COVID reported and there's data to show that they actually had improved symptoms. And then there were people who had the same, and then there were people who had worsening symptoms after okay. after getting it. And there hasn't been tons of follow up studies looking at that, but we do have those early re- like those early studies that did show that trend where some got better, some had slightly worsening symptoms, and some reported no change. Yeah, that's a really tough one. If it could go either way, and it's hard to predict, we don't really know yet how to predict what will happen for you, right? Right, exactly. So the last question I have, we are doing perfectly for time, um, is advice for people who have long COVID and seeking treatment. What advice do you have on finding, um, you know, the best available treatments? Yeah, this is also hard because we're still learning. There's still so much we don't know about long COVID in general. So it's hard to know how to effectively treat it. But there are there are scientists who are working on this. And I know there are scientists at Yale and other locations that have long COVID clinics who are working with these patients and trying things that they're hoping um, will help these patients. So I, I would suggest trying to reach out to your provider. And if, if you can't find any resources from them to try to reach out to some of these long COVID clinics mm-hmm. and they're scattered kind of throughout. I know Boston has one. I know Yale has one and there's other other like research medical mm-hmm. centers tend to have some of these mm-hmm. and they might be able to link you with some of the new work that's being done related to how we might be able to like mm-hmm. help people who have long COVID. There's also a review that I know you're going to share after. Um, mm-hmm. It was I from a variety of, of some from a variety of authors that kind of summarizes what we kind of know right now and some of the work being done and has some tables of therapies that are being considered and the evidence for them. Mm. And bringing that to your provider 
might be a helpful as a way of starting a conversation. Because honestly, like not every provider, unfortunately, depending on where you live, is going to be up to date on this type of research. So it's a it's I would hope that a provider would be willing to talk to you about some new data if you provided them with a resource yeah. to look at ahead of time. And if not, then I would hopefully help, like hopefully you can then find another mm -hmm. provider who would be willing to talk to you. Yeah. Because right now we're kind of in those stages where there's not really one clear way of, of treating it. I just really feel for anyone who's dealing with this. We just had someone drop a comment in saying, They've had long haul COVID for two and a half years and it's getting worse. What are the chances it's going to pull me down completely or might I bounce back? And I just think if you're one of the first people to have this, we just have no way of knowing, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's hard. And some people report getting better. And then I saw a recent statistic and I can pull out the source for this for you to add to your references later that um, only about eight percent of people right now are reporting like resolving of their long COVID symptoms. Mm. So there, so for people, for somebody who has long COVID, if they had it at one point in time, they likely still have it. So we really still need better data and better research to understand why and how we can help those patients. Yeah. Yeah. I have another um, reader comment, Lori from Lethbridge. Alberta, she said, I've had long COVID now for two years since getting COVID in December 2020. I've been trying to do everything, eat properly, vitamins, exercise. My doctor has sent me for so many tests. They're all coming back normal, but I'm declining. You know, how can I heal and recover? And I think that sounds like the best advice is try to find a long COVID clinic wherever that means traveling to if you're not getting the help you need from your healthcare provider. So, yeah. Yeah, um, we are pretty much out of time. We got three minutes left on the clock. So I just want to put in a plug for um, Liz's um, awesome accounts on social. She goes by Science with Liz. You can find her on Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter slash X, uh, and definitely Substack. You started a newsletter. So I'm going to drop in um, a link to some of those. And I'll also provide more links uh, once this conversation is on the nerdy girls website we'll be able to provide more links as well because liz gave a ton of references to back up what she's saying here which is what best practice for all scientists um, i also want to encourage you all of you to submit questions to the nerdy girls website at those nerdygirls.org and to sign up for our substack newsletter um, at substack.com so liz your newsletter is called from the science class and ours is called those nerdy girls yes. um, Anything else you want to add um, before we sign off here, Liz? I think the only thing I will add is that if you're somebody who's dealing with long COVID, um, know that you aren't forgotten. There's a lot of us who do think about you and are advocating for research into the cause and into treatments to help you in ways to better diagnose patients like you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy to kind of be, to feel like you're forgotten, but you're not. We, yeah. we remember you and there are others who do too. And then if you don't have long COVID, then I hope that you can learn more about it so that you can be an advocate for others and mm -hmm. so that you realize that it is a risk so that if something does happen to you in the future, you are aware of that as a possibility. Yeah. And I just, sorry, one last comment that um, I someone mentioned uh, on his comments here that traveling for long COVID can be difficult and exhausting. So we had talked before going live about um, this idea of rest and you know, radical rest being really important for some people. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so definitely, it definitely is true that we, we see that resting can make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is true that not everyone, and not only for health reasons, but also for economic reasons. So not everyone will have the ability to travel to a long COVID yeah. clinic. Yeah. I know some some clinics will see patients virtually. And then mm -hmm. this is why I suggested that reference that you could bring to your provider that kind of mm -hmm. summarizes some of the work being done to look at possible treatments. Yeah. And see, if you, and see if you can use that as a way for your own provider to help you try some of those things to see mm -hmm. and really try to find a provider locally who would be willing to do the research and try to help you, which is not, which I recognize is not easy, right? Mm -hmm. This is, this takes a lot of privilege to be able to travel and afford travel and have access to healthcare. And that's really, again, why we need more support systems 
from our institutions to help these patients. And that's why we need more research to make it easier. So I do, it's very true that that not everyone will be able to do that. And I, and I hope that that changes sooner versus later. Yeah. I, I just, I think this is an area that just desperately needs as much funding and resource and brain power as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Liz, and thank you to all of the listeners and readers who are here as well. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, and stay nerdy. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm going to try this, uh, try the Instagram log off, and then we'll log off on Restream as well. Bye. Bye. Okay, we're out of here.